blender blade philosophy here. Cutting philosophical ideas thinner than Occam's razor. Macro versus micro philosophy. Now, this is a distinction that I've been thinking about for quite a while, and I want to relay it to you here. But I know this is going to have some ups and downs. It's not going to be a smooth ride. So buckle in and and hopefully enjoy it. I know you won't, but hopefully. There's kernels. There's kernels. So don't, don't leave, honestly. It's about reason. And uh, isn't that where a lot of philosophical ideas start, is with reason? Yeah. So oftentimes we need to work on our reasoning. And I think pers- I think personally reason comes very cheaply. And I have, I, I've seen this everywhere. Like people throw around reasons left and right. It's concerning. And that's partly what this is about, but it's not exactly about reasons. But it, reasons play a part. They can always be applied afterwards as a justification. And this is why I'm suspicious of reasons. I'm always suspicious of reasons. It's like nice reasons you got there. But it's are reasons enough? I don't know. Sometimes I think it's enough to just say we like or dislike something, isn't it? You know, I might be talking to somebody and they might be like, you know, I think the aliens built the pyramids. Now I'll, I'll be like, yeah, you know what? That's I like that. I like that. You know, sometimes. I'm not saying all the time, but I'm just saying sometimes. It's it's enough to just be like, oh, you know, that sounds good. I, I, or, or I don't like that. Like, that's... Ah, uh, you. <sighs> Anyways. We need to dispense with one major idea here. And that's the common notion of the philosophical debate. The idea that in presenting enough honed arguments and compiling them all together, we're going to just vanquish our philosophical opponent and uh, utterly, uh, utterly eviscerate them, bring them to their knees, you standing above them with your gleaming armor and your sword shining in the sunlight pointed right directly at their throat. And you make them repent their misguided philosophical ways. No, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't happen. It never happens that way. We want it to happen that way. Um, We want to have people, you know, at our feet begging for their lives and repenting their, uh, their, their bad ways. But no, we don't get it. More often than not, it you know a philosophical debate ends in confusion, and both parties uh, they're just like, "What? What even happened there? I don't understand. I don't understand what happened." And the reason for this, obviously, is that we all use different languages, um, and even more importantly, we have different fundamental axioms within those languages. And it's no wonder. It's no wonder that we have a hard time. But I have two solutions. I see two ways of getting around these problems. And that is macro and micro philosophy. Now, starting with micro philosophy, this, this, is, the, this is the child of analytic philosophy, you could say. So it's the method that delves into these fundamental axioms, starting with the most fundamental, usually going all the way back to maybe like Descartes is evil demon, you know, um, all I can know is that I'm a thinking thing. And then, you know, working your way up only, you know, in tandem, in agreement with your interlocutor, moving to broader and broader topics. And now there's positives to this. So, you know, the positive is it's a very slow process, which it allows for very careful consideration. Um, it, it it allows you to go step by step with your partner and it promotes clear um, agreement between both parties. So it's like, okay, um, 
do you agree to this? And it's like, okay, we, you know, I, I can agree to that. And then we move on to the next step. Oh, do you agree to this? It's like step by step, step by step. I don't know what that song was, but anyway, the negatives, it's tedious. It's of course tedious and it sets up boundaries. Um, it creates oftentimes like a collaborative abstraction. Um, this is actually the most, uh, the biggest pitfall I think is that you're creating this, almost this little machine between your partner or your interlocutor. That's like, it's going to function, but it's only going to function in this context. And it, we'll get into this later. You'll see what I mean, but it, it leads to dead ends and worse. It leads to a false sense of agreement and nobody wants that. So on the other hand, we have macro analysis. Now, this involves the big picture. This is big picture thinking, and it's more indicative of like continental philosophy or poetry, art, that kind of thing. So instead of getting into the details, a macro analysis would focus on conclusions rather than specific terms or premises. Okay, obvious positives here. This allows people to fully showcase their view as a whole in their own language, uninterrupted by objections. The important conclusion, the, the important conclusions are completely laid bare. They're completely revealed and you can see them lying on the table and you can fondle them how you want after they're actually, you know, splayed out like that. The negatives, of course, are because these ideas are displayed as finished works, like uh, paintings in a museum, there's large room for interpretation and misunderstanding. And you'll see, we'll get into this later, but um, I think you can, already, you can already see where this is going. So I, my whole thesis is that I suggest we use the Mac review more often. It offers us something unique. It cuts to the chase. You know, I want something that's a time saver and not just that, not just the time saver, but the macro approach can actually break down these roadblocks, which the micro approach falls victim to. Now, of course, once we actually cut to the chase, get it all laid out to bear, then maybe we want to use a micro analysis um, to, to pick out the details. That is true, but... I'm mainly arguing that we, we need to start with a macro approach. Okay. Now, funny enough, we're going to get into the details of micro philosophy. So our beliefs are surely more than just a neat database of fundamental axioms, categorized propositions, just waiting to be perused more realistically than not. Our beliefs are like an interconnected web where the small and the large are nothing but irrelevant quantities, where the meaning of certain ideas holds sway in multiple ways, not just in the, as a piece in the hierarchical system, but how we actually know these beliefs and know how they're involved and what counts as a fundamental axiom. These are the questions that lead to confusion within micro philosophy. And how do we decide what's more fundamental? Like one person's fundamental axiom may hold very little important importance for another person's fundamental axiom. Man, like micro analyzing our axioms could in fact turn out to be more confusing in the end, lead to more confusion. Because at the end of the day, no matter how microscopically we analyze every little term, we're still using different languages we're still bringing in different meanings and we don't know how much one person puts importance on a certain term versus another person. We don't know how it connects to the whole. That's, that's actually the biggest problem is we don't know how it connects to like the grand, um, intention that they, why they actually, um, proposed this idea in the first place. Okay. So I have examples and this is just an example. I came up with for a micro analysis and this is something like a platonic dialogue, but it's supposed to be, uh, not as good as, uh, 
platonic dialogue, of course. <laughs> and I, do, I just have myself, so um, bear with me, but I do, I have puppets. This is where the puppets come into play. So um, don't look at me, look at the puppets. And they're going to perform the dialogue for you here. Okay, so we're going to have this, this gentleman represent the positive position. And then we're going to have this lady represent the, uh, the other position. Actually, no, I'm changing that. I'm changing it around. I don't know why, but I think this works a little bit better with the, the character's dynamics. Okay. Uh, I, I believe that ideas are the fundamental constituents of reality. What, what do you mean by ideas? And what do you mean by fundamental constituents? I hold that ideas are thoughts which organize a concept. By fundamental constituents, I mean that they are all reality is. Now, you, you must explain these concepts and what you mean by organizing a concept. Concepts are ideas formed into the things which we know, trees, cars, etc. We can organize ideas to form more complex concepts, which are all made up of ideas. Do we create these concepts freely? Or, if the concepts are all that reality is, can we create concepts of a round square in reality? No, of course, we can't create a concept of a round square. In reality, do we have, we have, we have freedom to create concepts freely. However, there are still logical constraints that stop certain concepts from holding in reality. Now, it sounds like you're creating two worlds, one for logical concepts, which only hold in reality, and one for illogical concepts, which don't hold in reality. Yeah, I suppose there are concepts which exist, but do not manifest in reality. What do you... What do you mean they exist? Uh, I merely mean that they exist on another level than the concepts like trees or cars. Okay, now what do you, what do you mean on another level? Uh, they do not appear to us. We do not sense them. So, you mean to say that some ideas are sensible while others are unsensible? Yes. If reality is nothing but ideas, then our senses are nothing but ideas as well? True. If senses are ideas, then our senses can change depending on our conception of them? I suppose so. Then how do we differentiate, how do we differentiate between the ideas seen and unseen? If the verification of these ideas relies on the ideas themselves, which are subject to change, and are unreliable, how must we trust them? They are not unreliable. Remember that reality is constrained by logic, so our senses are reliable because they are logical. Oh, yes. I forgot about this logic. Tell me more of this logic. Logic... Logic is what structures reality. It is fundamental. So you mean to say that logic is an idea as well, as everything is an idea? Of course logic. Of course logic is. Logic is unseen like the round square, but of course it is logical, unlike the round square. But I thought that only illogical ideas were unseen. Wasn't that their very conception? Description? Logic is the most fundamental idea. It's what comes before any conception. It precedes the ideas. It precedes the ideas that are seen. If logic is the precursor to all ideas, then how do logic illogical ideas arrive, like the round square? Logic is only fundamental for the logical ideas. We can create illogical ideas. We can still create illogical ideas, of course. Okay, but now we have created three divisions. Ideas which are seen and logical, ideas which are unseen and illogical, and ideas which are unseen and logical. 
That is right. But explain what makes ideas logical and illogical. Logic is a constant set of rules which is unchanging and organizes the ideas. Okay, so logic is a set of ideas which is unchanging. Now you understand me. So, now we have ideas which are unchanging and logical. Ideas that are changing, seen, and logical. Ideas that are unchanging, seen, and logical. Ideas that are unseen and illogical. What about ideas that are unchanging and illogical? Could you have constant rules that are unchanging but illogical? I guess so, but they would be pretty useless. Are those not would would those not be the same rules which would govern govern the illogical ideas like that of the round square? Perhaps. Then what would differentiate unseen logical ideas from unseen illogical ideas? Both would presumably have an unchanging set of rules which govern them. Obviously, this is ridiculous. Remember, logical ideas can't... Remember, logical ideas are the ones that can be sensed. Oh, yes, I remember. Although, I do recall that sense was governed by logic. No doubt. But... Which logic? The illogical logic or the logical logic? Of course, the logical logic. Are you insane? But how would one ever know if their senses were using logical logic or illogical logic? Certainly because they're sensing the logical ideas and not the round squares. It seems that your argument is just as round as the very squares you speak of. Oh, frick off, you. Um, okay. Sorry for that. I feel as though we can relate to the previous conversation. I feel as though we can. You know, as weird as that was, there's some, there's some kernel of truth in that, you have to admit, that you've seen, you know, you've seen this before. It can feel as though we're getting nowhere and not in a hurry. It feels like unnatural, sterile, as you clearly stay, clearly seen. This is because addressing every little such detail abstracts from the overall idea at large. Now, this can be engaging and even enlightening as a practice, but its faults are very apparent. We lose the message and begin creating dialectically a world of our own. The world we create is always far removed from the original point. Say the original intention of this conversation was to posit some like idealist version of free will. From the beginning, this microscopic analysis gets caught in the weeds and the macroscopic meaning completely eludes our grasp because we're down in the dirt fighting over the different distinctions between ideas. Now let's look at what macroanalysis can offer us on the other hand. No more puppets, but but here it is. Here's the example of a macro philosophy analysis. Say I come up to you and I have an idea. And say we're just in a relaxed environment, just hanging out. Just pretend I'm your friend. The cosmos is a connected whole. This is what I believe. There's no division beyond the manifestations which we can distinguish with language. It's like a free agent, entirely open, indeterminate. We're just manifestations of this unlimited freedom. And so we can posit these uh, linguistic, linguistic distinctions as we see fit. A tree might be uh, singled out one day, but it could easily fade away. You know, one might be a tree uh, when the desire to chop is overwhelming, but one might be a non-tree when you're up on the mountain and the forest below is nothing but a manifest one. 
Everything is always changing, yet everything remains one, the humming cosmos. We choose how to divide this one by our desire, and our desire manifests as a drive. This overwhelming drive comes from our relation with all other manifesting drives which permeate throughout the cosmos, all drives in relation to every other drive. This ultimate interconnectedness for desire is where true freedom lies. True, fe true freedom is the recognition of the balance of the cosmos. When one realizes that each division of the cosmos reverberates through all other divisions, and the ontology is both multitudinous and unifying all in the same breath, that is when one realizes that only manifestations and never separations are we from the cos cosmos as a whole. So that is the example of macro philosophy. Now, right away, we get the idea of what the macro meaning is from the text. I don't know if you, you noticed that, but one large sweep gives, a, gives us so much to work with. Now, we can tell that this guy appreciates feeling one with the universe. I think we can all grasp that. Furthermore, they feel strongly about making a connection between this type of cosmic monism and a type of freedom of the will, a free will uh, argument. This, the style is very like freely expressed in this natural way. Um, it relieves the interlocutors of any kind of like awkward trench digging. Um, and it's much closer basically to the way that an average person speaks. But it also retains a lot of lofty philosophical rigor, I want to argue. Just because something isn't a dialogue back and forth, getting into the details, doesn't mean that there aren't some, some very lofty philosophical uh, ideas being flung around here. Oh, undoubtedly, some aspects might need greater for clarification. Like we said before, we're using different languages. Um, there's going to be misunderstandings, especially if you're just unloading that in one, one big lump sum, you know, but the point is the original motivation will emerge clearly from even the most messy examples. When everything is laid to bear uh, like that and, and the whole perspective is on the table, the truth will emerge, uh, so to speak. And after we, you know, after we see it on the table, we can pick out certain targets and get into the microanalysis. But only after the macro. And, I, and here I like to think about uh, what painters do. Likewise, they use the strategy of blocking out the canvas. So they'll paint the broad strokes um, before actually getting into the fine details with the small brushes. And I think that we should do philosophy like this as well. I think it's a very fruitful method. And not only does it save time, but I think it actually gets to the heart of what people are trying to say. Thank you.